everyone. I recently uploaded a video in my Dartmoor playlist um, where I showed some footage of my last walk up on Dartmoor um, visiting a place called Urn Pits and Black Lane Brook and Ducks Pool um, which is this area in the centre of the map that you, that, uh, you can see here. Just zoom in a Um, so this is Ducks Pool here, and uh, Black Lane Brook runs down here into the River Urm, and Urm uh, Pits is the site of a lot of ancient tin working, so the area's been um, severely disturbed by tin working in the past. Um, but one of, one of uh, my viewers, uh, Nigel Darkling Eldridge, asked me whether I had a copy of Crossing's Guide to Dartmoor. And the reason he asked that was that at Ducks Pool, there's actually a memorial to uh, Crossing. And um, I do have the guidebook. Um, and I wanted to talk to you a little bit about... Um, three different uh, books about Dartmoor in particular that I own, but um, I'm going to cover a lot of other books as well, um, because I thought it would be interesting for you just to, to hear a little bit about, a bit, bit more about Dartmoor if you don't know the area. Um, and also the three books... Um, approach Dartmoor in entirely different ways and it will give you a little bit of um, an insight into why I find Dartmoor such a, a fascinating place to to visit and to explore. Um, so the three books I want to principally deal with are Crossing's Guide to Dartmoor um, book called Worth's Dartmoor and a third book by an author called Eric Hemery which is called High Dartmoor. Um, now let's go back to Crossing to begin with. Um, Crossing is a really famous name um, in relation to um, studies of Dartmoor. Um, so famous in fact that um, you might be mistaken in thinking that he was um, a contemporary or almost contemporary writer but in fact um, he's very much of the Victorian era. He was, he was born in Plymouth in 1847 and um, died at the age of or, well, he was, it was 1928 when he died, so he had a fairly long life, um, particularly with regard to the Victorian era. Um, and his love of Dartmoor stemmed from um, just exploring the, the paths and escaping onto the moor. Um, when, as I say, he was born in Plymouth and grew up in Plymouth, but he's parents were, um, I suppose you could describe them as middle class, they had, uh, I think they owned mills, I can't remember exactly, um, they owned, they, they, the father owned businesses anyway, um, but they would holiday on the edge of Dartmoor um, each year, and that was where Crossing got his initial love of the moor, um, but he was very much... Uh, how can we say it? he wasn't at all um, applied to his father's business. He was a bit of a wanderer. He went to sea when he was a young man. Um, he he established a drama, a, a touring drama group. I think at one point he never he never really wanted to settle down and apply himself to. Um, uh, 
enterprise or industry or anything like that. And Dartmoor suited him ideally just as a, a way of wandering off and escaping into his own thoughts and, and uh, reverie. And um, over the course of his life, he explored Dartmoor extensively and wrote a lot of um, works on Dartmoor. Uh, he wrote for local newspapers and had, had books published. And um, his guide to Dartmoor is really um, an anthology of his um, roots and so on, the, the pathways and uh, tracks and trails that he followed. And it was only published quite late in his life. It was first published, I think, in 1908 or 1909. Um, this particular paperback is um, a reprint of the second edition, which was printed in 1912. And I think there was a third edition um, in 1915. But this, this is a reprint of the edition, the 1912 edition, um, that was reprinted in, in the 1960s. Um, now, the point about the Crossing's Guide to Dartmoor, uh, as, I, as I said in my reply to Nigel, is that um, it's, it's very much um, connected to, it literally is a guide. It's, it's, it's what you would um, describe as a proper guide. In other words, it will take you across the moor, so as you read it, um, it will point out landmarks and tracks and trails and so on so that you can actually use it in order to um, make a journey or walk across a particular part of the moor which is why it's so popular even today with um, walkers on the moor because obviously um, the landscape doesn't change that much over the over the centuries, so it's always that what applied in Crossings Day applies today. Um, that you can navigate using uh, tours and rivers and various paths that you'll come across. Um, but but I wouldn't describe it as a particularly poetic. book, it doesn't really um, do it for me in the way that some of these other books that I'm going to talk about do. It's very much about the, the surface of Dartmoor and f navigating your way across it. Um, and he does deal a lot with um, the history as well. But he does it in a way just to give you little little snippets of information about places as you pass them. Um, doesn't to me really give the what I think of as the essence of Dartmoor. Um, ironically, he he was writing. He did spend his entire life writing something that would have matched that description that I'm trying to give you. Um, but when he was an old, old man living um, in Mary Tavy, um, his housekeeper, when he was absent from the house, discovered all these uh, pages that he was writing, a manuscript, it was a lifetime's work, and they were nibbled away by, at by mice and so on, and she just thought they were rubbish, and she burned the entire lot. Um, so. The work that he was compiling, which I'm sure would have been an epic um, piece of literature, was destroyed accidentally and lost lost to the world. Um, but anyway, very much a Victorian era writer. Um, he approaches Dartmoor. You have to you have to you have to read the book, realizing that he's approaching it from the perspective of someone living in the 
late 19th century, um, as you do with this second book that I was talking about, Worth Startmore. Now this book was um, published in 1953 after, uh, I think his name was Richard Hansford Worth. Oh, Hansford Worth, yeah. After he had died, he, Hansford Worth was also born in Plymouth and is also a Victorian um, person. He was born in 1868 and he died in 1950 and this book was published in 1953, so posthumously, but it's effectively an anthology of his writings and his work during his lifetime. So it's a collection of, of all his work. Um, now, he is an entirely different type of character to Crossing. Worth is... Um, what you would describe as an antiquarian. Um, so really, one of those early um, amateur archaeologists, if you like, but not amateur in a derogatory sense, simply a person who had a lot of time and resources to apply to his interests, which were looking at the Moors history and all the antique remains that are on the moor, the stone circles, the stone rows, um, the ruins of buildings and tin workings and all that kind of thing, the leets, the, the functioning moor, the moor as it was lived in. Um, so his work on Dartmoor um, wouldn't help you if you were trying to navigate your way across the moor. That's not what you would use it for. You go to it as a reference um, to um, explain a lot of the places that you have visited. Um, so he will, he will, in it, he will have lots of maps and diagrams of um, stone circles such as this one. Go button tour. Um, so laid out in a very kind of scientific, forensic way, um, he was responsible for restoring a lot of the stone circles on Dartmoor, um, re-erecting fallen stones and that kind of thing. Um, so very much a kind of antiquarian archaeologist, and I would value this book more highly than I would. Crossing, even though um, it's not of such practical use in finding your way around the, the moor, um, it appeals to me more because of my interest in history and my interest in archaeology and that kind of thing. And I like it for its reference material and for its um, scientific approach, really. Um, so again, not a kind of, he, he does have lots of fascinating um, snippets about um, folklore and about the history of the moor and the traditions and so on. But it's all collected and compiled in a, a far more academic way. Um, Whilst I'm on Worth, I think I'll just introduce you to another um, Victorian gentleman. So not one of the three books I want to concentrate on. But there was another Victorian gentleman called the Reverend S. Baring Gould. And this book is, a, is what you might... Uh, I only obtained this recently from um, my friend who I walk on the moor with. Um, his wife noticed this book in a, in a second-hand bookshop and... Um, obtained it for me. Um, but this is really a reprint or a replica, you might say. Um, so it was only it was only printed recently, um, 2002. Um, but it's a replica of a Victorian um, book on Dartmoor. Um, and S. Baring Gould 
had a similar kind of passion as Worth. He does, he does um, go into a little bit more of the, the legends and the history of Dartmoor, but as you can see, he's just as interested as Worth was in, in the artefacts and so on. These are flint arrowheads that were found on the moor. And he's just as interested in the stone circles, but he doesn't have that academic approach. He has more of a romantic approach. So he he um, really knew very little about the actual um, precise history of the stone rows and so on. So he was more prone to attribute them to um, the druids or something like that rather than their um, proper uh, Bronze Age history. Um, so a lot of his, a lot of his, is his, his his book is based on conjecture and mythic kind of uh, a mythic, more mythic approach to the more. Um, I've, I haven't read it yet, and um, it's not one of the three that I wanted to concentrate on. But I will, I will come back to this in a minute. Um, but the other, the third book that I really did want to um, draw your attention to is Eric Hemery's High Dartmoor. Now, Hemery is a completely different kettle of fish. He's far more contemporary. Um, he wrote this book in the 1950s. Um, I tried searching for him on Wikipedia and can't find him. So he, he, it's possible he may still even be alive. Um, he would be fairly elderly by now if he, if he was. But um, his book um, is a much more personal, um, but at the same time th far more thorough and comprehensive book than either Worth or um, Crossing. Um, but it's, as I say, it's a far more personal view and um, much more interested almost in the poetry of them all, in the, um, in the sensations and the experience of, of exploring them all. Um, it, it's absolutely joyous, but he does it in a way that you can actually follow his description. He, he has written other books um, which are closer to crossing where you can follow a route and follow the landmarks from one to the other. The way he does this book is he lays it out by river valleys really. So this is the Avon, um, just went past the Swincombe there. But he basically groups everything together by, there's the Yelm, by river valleys, the Plym, um, and he will describe everything that you might come across in that valley. But he'll also um, colour it with his own personal reflections and his own experiences and the people that he encountered and the animals that he might have seen, that kind of thing. So it's, a, it's far more complete description of the moor, it encapsulates the entire experience from the history to the geography to the people and to the flora and fauna and all that kind of thing. Um, and I, I, it, it's probably um, similar to that work that Crossing's um, housekeeper destroyed accidentally. Um, and I don't think this book will ever, ever be bettered um, as a complete um, description of Dartmoor. Um, so it's a wonderful thing really to, um, to be able to read um, something that's go that will, will gain in importance as the centuries go by because as with all things, um, so much is being lost. Um, Dartmoor is changing very slowly, but the people on it are slowly changing in their professions and their occupations and their lifestyles and so on. The old ways of, 
do disappear. And this is a wonderful kind of um, uh, lens on Dartmoor as it was and as it was up until the 1950s. Um, so it, in order to demonstrate that, I thought I would, which is why I've got the um, bookmarks in here, it's why I thought I would concentrate on um, reading to you how each of these specific, these, those last four authors cover this area of Ducks Pool while I went to on um, that last video that I uploaded. But before I do that, I just wanted to kind of um, describe to you how um, the moor has changed in terms of how it's perceived by the public, and in particular, um, how it was regarded in the Victorian era, as opposed to how it is regarded nowadays, because it is, that has changed dramatically. Now, um, one of Dartmoor's um, principal features is not just its spectacular geography, but it's, it, it, it's the home of um, a wealth of Bronze Age remains. Um, probably more, there are probably more Bronze Age sites in this area um, than any other area in northwestern Europe or even Europe as a whole. Um, and so you're talking about a period going back to about 3000 BC onwards, really ancient remains and lots of them um, that haven't been destroyed, be partly because the moor hasn't been dwelt on um, in any kind of, by any concentrated population. Um, much of the landscape is still as it was uh, 5,000 years ago. Um, and you can't not see all these things as you're going around. So this, this, would, this would have an immediate um, impression on anybody who wanted to um, describe them or, or um, write a history of them all. Um, now, the reason it wasn't inhabited up to the present day is that in the Bronze Age period, um, it had a different climate climate. Um, the land was more fertile, um, it, was, it was productive in terms of um, the crops but also in terms of um, uh, pasturage for cattle and so on so it was, it was able to sustain quite a large population. That all changed with the climate change and from then on, it was really an area where you could pasture cattle, possibly, um, but it was more valued for the mineral wealth on the moor itself. Um, so from the Middle Ages up to about the 18th century, um, it became an area that was extensively exploited, in particular for tin. And as you, that's the second thing that you will, apart from the, apart from the, um, the, the natural geography, the granite tours and so on, and apart from the um, Bronze Age remains and Iron Age remains, that's, I should say, the third thing rather than the second thing. Uh, the third thing you will notice is huge amounts of land that have been turned over and... Um, and worked for their tin, so you can you can either get the tin from the streams, or you can get it by open cast mining. Um, and then, as the 18th century um, industrial revolution developed and mining techniques improved, there were also mines dug, shafts dug into them into the moor, um, and all those all those different types of extraction of tin 
um, have uh, affected the appearance of the moor. So I thought I'd just show you um, a couple of little bits of stone from the moor. Um, so you can see sort of black veins in these rocks and that is a substance called cassiterite and it's that substance from which tin can be extracted by smelting. Um, so the original um, uh, way of obtaining tin, as I say, was to just to sift it from streams and then you get to open cast mining where um, the rock would be extracted and it would be broken up and then placed over furnaces um, originally just holes in the ground um, and the rocks would be heated with charcoal and um, the tin would emerge from the the rocks and flow into the into the holes um, and collected in that way and there's not much left in the way of signs of that kind of activity because holes um, in the ground obviously fill up quite quickly but that would have been the original method in the in the middle ages um, as you get into the, the sort of 15th and 16th centuries um, you start to get a more kind of industrial method um, so you'll have furnaces that are heated by bellows and the bellows would be operated by water power so you need um, you need to harness the water power either by um, creating artificial channels and leaks that would operate wheels that would then operate the bellows um, or um, you can I suppose you could you could actually just put a, a mill into a stream but um, I think the majority of them were were we use, would use leets and um, in order to do that um, you'd also construct what were known as blowing houses um, so th there's a lot of blowing houses um, still left as ruins on the moor um, sort of rectangular structures um, they would often have a flue or a chimney and um, possibly somewhere like a wheel pit next to them so you see remains of buildings um, and they th those all date mainly back to the 17th century so they are quite an impressive age as ruins um, mining obviously still went on on the moor the, the last tin mines um, ceased production just before the second world war and the processes obviously became more um, developed as time went by so there are mines such as the Hooton Wills mine um, in the valley of the Obrook um, which have large circular uh, areas that where the the tin was extracted by um, allowing uh, water to flow over um, the, the deposits so, so you've got a sort of sedimentation process going on as well but um, principally the open cast mining is you, you have to have some kind of method of pounding the rocks hammering um, or knocking knocking the rock um, and then another method of heating it uh, originally using charcoal um, but then as the 18th century developed using coal um, although the sort of purists would say that the tin extracted using the charcoal method um, was much a much purer method, um, in, in the coal somehow sort of tainted tainted the tin, um, and then as I said, as the 18th century goes on, you have two things happening. One is that. Um, uh, The country as a whole, England as a whole, sees the development of road systems and so on. Now, 
Dartmoor in particular is, is covered by ancient trackways, um, none of them suitable for uh, modern, as we're talking 18th century here, modern life and the industrial age. Um, so in the 1770s, there was actually a, um, an Act of Parliament, um, which is mentioned in here, I'll just mention this wonderful book here, Dartmoor, it's a history of Dartmoor, prisoner of war, war depot and the, and the jail. Um, but he describes in here um, how Princeton, where the, the prison is um, developed at fr as, uh, as a result, really, of Princeton gaining a kind of prominence because of the construction of this road. Um, I haven't got marked to the right page here to... Here we go. It was a highway approved by an Act of 1772. And um, it was it came about under the influence of the Duke of Bedford, who was an, a landowner in the Tavistock area, and um, it links Dartmoor from Tab it links goes across Dartmoor from Tavistock to Morton, Ham Hampstead, and Ashburton, and that road is still there t to this day. Um, but that enabled. Um, a, a lot more access to the moor. So tin mining was beginning to um, diminish and the moor opened the possibility of um, easier access to the, the road, the highway rather, gave, it gave easier access to the moor and, a, and it, uh, it offered the opportunity for people to purchase land and enclose land. Um, enclosure was a really big um, social issue in the 18th century because it, it enabled landowners to um, exploit land um, by containing it and um, removing um, small tenants from it and so on and turning land usage into a more industrial um, process. So economies of scale and that kind of thing. Um, but as it turned out, um, the actual climate of the moor, as I was saying earlier about the Bronze Age, didn't suit um, agriculture. So a lot of these early enclosures um, failed and um, the mine went back, sorry, the moors went back to being um, an area where you could you could maintain a few herds of cattle or flocks of sheep or something, but you certainly couldn't grow crops or one person tried to grow flax and that failed. Um, it proved, it proved un, unusable as a sort of an agricultural area. Um, but ironically, at the same time, the Industrial Revolution was going on, mining techniques were improving and it opened up, a, it gave a new lease of life to the tin mining industry um, in that it enabled entrepreneurs to sink shafts into the ground and to extract mine in that way. So it gave a sort of uh, a, a slightly longer lease of life to the tin mining industry. Um, but one of the other the effects that that, that um, enclosure had was that um, it created a kind of uh, a new sort of landowning um, hierarchy, a, a new a new strata of society on the moor, in that you had you had uh, people who owned vast tracts of the moor. Um, they were interested in um, obtaining building materials to build their houses, to build their uh, country estates and so on. Um, and it was around that time that D Dartmoor um, became an obvious source for a wonderful building material, which is granite. Um, this is a piece of granite from um, close to Trollsworthy. Um, 
really good building material. Um, so it, it came, it became used for the local houses and so on, but and and lots of buildings in the adjacent towns and cities. Plymouth is cluttered with granite, grey granite, and red granite buildings. Um, but it also um, led to um, quarries uh, exporting the granite to much further afield. Lots of London bridges and so on um, obtained their granite from um, quarries on Dartmoor, such as the Maryvale Quarry. Um, so the tin mining um, was paralleled from the, from the sort of late 18th century onwards by um, granite extraction and and uh, and so on. I mean, a good example is up up on Charlesworthy. There are the remains of um, some cut granite that uh, was going to be used in Devonport. Devonport was um, uh, achieving a kind of prominence in the early 19th century and they cut a lot of granite to use for various monuments and so on. And uh, some of it is still still up there, didn't get used. Um, another use of the moor um, is for military purposes and that has been the case um, certainly since the late 18th century, early 19th century. So there are three areas of the moor that are still um, ranges where you have to check that there's not um, artillery practice or firing live firing practice going on before you stray onto them. Huge tracks, but you'll often, while you're up there, you'll often see um, uh, marines and so on, parachute regiments, I believe, up there as well. Um, on manoeuvres and exercises and training um, and that as I say has been the case ever since the early 19th, late 18th century so um, Worth in particular comments a lot on um, the use of the land for um, army army manoeuvres because it did, it did have an impact on a lot of the um, Bronze Age and, and prehistoric remains up there, and there was quite a bit of damage done. Um, that unfortunate kind of habit continued right up until um, the Second World War, where um, there were um, stone, standing stones and so on that we actually used as target practice. Um, the Americans up there were up there during the Second World War as well, prior to the D-Day invasions. Um, there were firing ranges up there. This is a um, a bullet that I I, uh, I found up there. Um, it probably dates to the um, 1940s, 1950s. Um, so that is another thing that's had an impact on the moor, um, and you you notice when you're up there. So all those things um, are going to affect. Uh, anyone who writes about them all and um, as I say Worth in particular um, commented a lot on on the impacts of the military up there um, but the, the, these two the two Victorian era um, writers of the law Worth and Crossing um you have to kind of put yourself in their shoes, really. That um, back in the in the nineteenth century, at the beginning of the nineteenth century, um, up until the beginning of the nineteenth century, it had been a very common um, pursuit of uh, the wealthier classes to travel abroad, to take the grand tour, and to. Um, travel in, into Italy and Greece in particular and the um, locations of early civilizations of the Roman Roman Empire uh, the Greek society so um, they would go there they would um, uh, 
pursue their kind of artistic and historical interests. They would read the classics. They would um, scramble over the ruins of ancient Rome and the Acropolis in Athens and all this kind of thing. They would come back with their um, artworks, their landscapes by um, notable painters and so on, bring them back, put them in their homes, their stately homes. Um, all that changed at the beginning of the 19th century. Of course, England is now at war with uh, Napoleon and um, the Grand Tour is curtailed and English, English uh, gentry and so on and nobility have to look in on themselves. They have to look um, at their own country and what it can offer because they can't travel abroad in the same way. And places like Dartmoor immediately take on a greater significance because of that. Um, because as, I, as I've tried to explain, there is so much on Dartmoor that um, you can examine and you can um, investigate and um, artists can go there. So it's in the 19th century that you get artists um, beginning to paint landscapes of, of places like Dartmoor, um, Turner and an artist called Widgery, um, lots of others. Um, so Dartmoor, Dartmoor's, the, the way society is looking at Dartmoor and approaching it has changed. It's gone from being a place that's a wilderness and remote and harsh and bleak and is the uh, the home of tin miners and rough and ready farmers and, and miners and it's turning into a more kind of romantic place, a place that's got a history to it, a place that can be explored and its beauty can be appreciated and its history can be wondered over. Um, and this is really why Worth in particular is um, a writer of his time. This is exactly what he's exploring. Um, crossing as well, Crossing's doing it in a more, as I say, in a more kind of escapist way. He simply just wants to get out into the open air and to walk and to exercise, um, but also to kind of identify where he is and find his way and navigate his way across the 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 the, um, the more. So, as I said earlier, I'm sorry, I've been working on quite a long time already. I wanted to kind of like show you how each of these three different writers, in particular, um, treats the area of Duck's Pool. And I'm going to start with um, Crossing because it's actually at Duck's Pool that there is a memorial to Crossing, and notice something that's called a letterbox. Talk a little bit more about letterboxing um, shortly. So, Crossing has quite a few um, entries on Duck's Pool, but I'll try to abbreviate this a little bit and just um, just deal on one pertinent one. Uh, Right, so he is here in this in this art in this entry here. Um, he is literally describing um, the area in terms of navigating your way around it by looking at specific points. So he's talking about the first point is a large stream work on the Black Lane Brook, nearly a mile and a half distant. Its direction being east southeast by east. This course the rambler accordingly follows up the hill leaving some rocks known as Great Nat's Head a little to the right. So you can see he is being very precise about bearings and compass directions and points on the map that you can navigate um, your way around. Um, when on the summit of the hill, which is, is referring to Great Nat's Head, and one mile from the ford, the line of route passes near Duck's Pool, which will be seen on the left. 
Care must be taken in ascending this hill not to bear too much to the left, or the rambler will get onto the fen surrounding the source of the, flim, the plim. It is better that he should err by keeping a little too much to the right. When Duck's Pool is passed, the stream work will soon be sighted. Um, so, in other words, he, that is a very... Um, um, I think I used the word poetic before. So it is very un unromantic, unpoetic. It's a kind of practical um, description of how you've got to kind of cross this area. Um, I did somewhere, I, was, I did make a note of... Um, he, he describes the dangers. He did say about trying to err uh, to the right rather than the left there. Um, but he does, he does kind of uh, use a little bit more um, dramatic language, um, talking about uh, the dangers of, of getting into that watery area. Um, yeah, it's talking about Duck's Pool again here. It's still called a pool, though, containing no water. It is in a remote situation in the midst of the fen and has been associated with the heron or crane. Um, the latter appears in the name of the more ho northern hollow and in the present case in Cat Crane Hill. Um, yeah, that's not the, that, that does give you a bit more of a kind of uh, pause for thought in terms of how do things get their name and so on. But uh, unfortunately, I have mislaid yeah I won't spend too much long looking for it but he describes um, entering the chilly embrace of the waters of, of that mire um, right now Worth as you would expect I hope from my previous explanation of what he's about um, is far more um interested in describing the uh, man-made artefacts and buildings and structures and so on that you're going to find on the moor. So he's not interested in navigating you across this relatively dangerous area. Um, so he's got a little entry on Black Lane Brook here, which is the area that um, the water from Ducks Pool flows from... Uh, where is it? It flows from Duck's Pool down into Black Lane Brook, which is this area here, and then into the River Erm. So he's really talking about, um, first of all, he's talking about Blowing House, which is one of those um, buildings that are saying that, uh, that are the remains of tin working. Um, and he's talking about uh, the Blowing House near Black Lane Brook, and he's describing the building as measuring 11 foot 6 inches by over 18 foot inside measurement lies on the right bank of the little tributary which flows from Ducky Pool. Um, the leet is clearly traceable, which is the leet that would supply the water power to the wheel at the Blowing House. Um, uh, the leet is clearly traceable and there is the usual raised bank to take the launder which fed the wheel. Um, so that is very kind of um, almost an archaeologist sort of description of the area rather than um, someone who's trying to guide you across it. And, uh, yeah, that's, that's more or less it. So no, no kind of description of the, of the birds, of the wildlife, of finding a way across it, of the kind of history of the place. It's very, and that is how he treats the other areas like the stone circles and the stone roads it's all precise measurements diameters and radiuses and circumferences and heights and all that kind of thing um, so quite a scientific approach now Hemery um, on the other hand um, talks about Ducks Pool in this, this way. West of the stream is Crane Hill, at the southeast foot of which lies Wallake. Ducks Pool Stream, a large watery hollow. Patches of open water alternate with mire, rich in bog plants, and form an area potentially dangerous for walkers. 
This is Duck's Pool, a once natural lonely tarn with high banks until the tin has drained it. Now it is neither a tarn nor lonely, but at least nature still holds sway. Um, so you, you can see in that the writing, he, he's now into, this is like the 1950s now, rather than the Victorian era. And he is almost um, regretting a loss there. I mean, he referred to Duck's Pool as being no longer lonely. Um, he has a real bee in his bonnet about that. And part of the reason is, um, uh, I must have done that, we're letterbox, which I, as I said before, I'm gonna, I was gonna come back to. So letterboxing is a really good example of the 20th century's attitude and approach to Dartmoor. Um, in the 20th century, you get far more recreational um, pastimes on, on the moor. Um, it's, it's still a place of beauty and it's still a place of um, wonder and, and historical interest and so on. And people like Hemery are still approaching it in that way. Um, but you've got much greater access to the moor. Um, the road systems are, are improving, um, but unlike in the 18th century when the roads enabled entrepreneurs and landowners and businessmen to get on the moor, now the modern roads and the modern motor car and cycles and so on are allowing um, weekenders and holiday makers and so on to go up and, on the moor and experience it from themselves, to experience a bit of wilderness and, and to um, practice their map reading and to exercise and to try and match the endurance of the military in their training and so on and to do a bit of rugged outdoor um, healthy pursuits as it were and letterboxing um, this this letterbox at Ducks Pool was put there um, in the 1930s right next to the memorial to crossing um, and there's another permanent letterbox at another pool called Cranmere Pool which is sort of more in the north side of the moor and um, it's just basically a pursuit where um, a rubber stamp and a an ink uh, pad are left and you take a book with you and you get you take the stamp out of the tin box or whatever it's in and stamp your um, your notebook or whatever it is and you collect all these different letter boxes from areas of the moor and some of them are in quite difficult to reach difficult to access places and it's that very few of them are actually marked specifically on the map so they're quite hard to find some of them are just secreted away in niches on tours or under stones and so on um, they take a little bit of tracking down um, Hemery hates that absolutely hates it um, so I wanted to read to you um, as I, said, as I said a moment ago, he's decrying the fact that to him, this area here is no longer remote, it's no longer lonely because it's attracting people just looking for that letterbox. So he, he really dislikes that disturbance to his solitude and his reverie, that he, he wants them all almost to himself. Um, but it, it's partly because he appreciates that... Um, people aren't, they're valuing the moor for a different reason. They're not valuing it for its sort of spiritual, poetic um, worth any longer. They're looking at it as a place of challenge, a place where you have to find your way from one landmark to another. The crossing is coming a little bit into his own in this respect, because it's giving, it's giving them a guide as to how to get from one area to another but it's removing that kind of romantic aspect to the moor 
Um, so let me just read to you. Uh, well, I'm just going to read to you a little bit about um, Hammery's description of the remains of tin works. Um, I think he's talking about some of the ones around uh, the Obrook in this this particular uh, um, fragment, but it could it could apply to any any part of the moor. So Henry writes, such a rich assortment of tinner's relics as still remain from stannery days on such a secluded and unspoiled site is to be seen nowhere but on Dartmoor. To visit them and reflect on their origins, industrial history and eventual desertion, to see the beauty of the meeting waters here and the fords, steps, tracks and venerable walls of the ancient tenement dwellers of a long past age all overlooked by the grey tours and green hills, is to sense the uniqueness of the central basin, basin as an oasis within which there are yet such beautiful pockets of wilderness as this. It is for such reasons that I remark many times in this work that the real Dartmoor remains a closed book to those visitors whose single interest it apparently is to beeline between tours and collect rubber stamp impressions from post boxes. So you can see it's really derisory about um, letterboxing in general there. But he has a point he, um, that, that it's sort of going from bad to worse, that um, back in the 50s and 60s, um, there was still a certain amount of um, inherent worth in, in finding your way around, navigating experiencing the weather and the climate and so on um, but all kinds of things are changing clothing is changing we've gone for we, you know we're in the age of Gore-Tex now map reading itself is becoming a, a thing of the past I mean I found this this is classic um, this fell off of someone's wrist on the moor it's a, a navigating device um, a Garmin one I actually found it, um, it had been dropped at a ford, and I saw it, I spotted it glinting underwater and took it out. It was covered, it had a strap that was covered in mildew and um, it was all rusted inside and so on. I have been able to get it to work, but not. I haven't worked out quite how it works yet. It's, I have downloaded the instructions, but that's not the point. Really, um, this is kind of... Um, as much of an artifact as as all these other all these other things that I've been showing you that I've collected off the moor in my travels, um, and it's really uh, I, I really kind of um, look on it as that it's uh, an artifact of present day uh, the present day Dartmoor experience and. You can you can see Henry's point that it is, um, you know, e even the sort of purists will um, find this unacceptable. Find the use of sat navs unacceptable if you're going letterboxing. I mean, I, I, on a previous um, video, I might I put I put some of the pictures up again on this, but there there is a. Well, there was a tiny cross um, not far from Foxtor, um, which was the smallest cross on Dartmoor, and very hard to find, really difficult to find, because it's only, it's probably only about four or five inches tall in itself, or was. Um, and so it was something that um, you could pride yourself on seeking out and finding, a bit like letterboxes. Um, but unfortunately, as um, soon as the age of GPS came in, um, someone marked its coordinates on GPS um, and then all you have to do is just walk to it and um, it was badly damaged and destroyed a couple of years ago. So I, I still haven't, I, I, I walked along for such a long time but I still haven't said everything that I wanted to say but I thought I would also... Um, I showed you this book earlier, the S. Reverend Baring Gould's book. Um, he doesn't he doesn't mention Duxpool 
specifically, but he does have a little um, a little bit about this area here, which is a little bit more uh, boggy and dangerous. And I've just been looking at this. And this is actually the bit that talks about chilly embraces. But he said he writes, there is a nasty little mire at the head of Redivan Lake between West Mill Tor and Yestor, and there is a choice collection of them inviting the unwary to their chill embraces on Cater's Beam above the sources of the Plym and Black Lane Brook, which is exactly there. This is the Black Lane Brook here. Um, so he um, yeah, and he says the ugliest of all occupying a pan and having no visible outlay. So he, he is talking specifically about bogs there, um, bogs on the moor. So he is, he is, he is treating Dartmoor in a slightly different way again and having themes about um, the bogs or the, uh, the army, that kind of thing. Um, he's even got a section there about the Druids. I think I mentioned earlier that uh, he was writing in a more... Um, Badly informed time, and, and thinking of the of the stone rows and circles as being uh, druidic in nature, um, and there are lots and lots of books on Dartmoor, um, but they all nowadays they all stem largely um, from this requirement that people um, have roots. Um, directing them um, around them all. So it's th these are aimed far more at that recreational walker um, and, and uh, short-term visitor rather than crossings and worths and so on which are directed more at someone who has got a long-term uh, interest and fascination in the moor. Uh, you can get them themed so you can have um, walks themed around the legends and the mysteries of the moor. Um, you can buy the. You don't even need to go to the moor to buy this kind of thing. Stories of the ghost stories and uh, t t tales of fairies and witches and so on in the moor. Um, but this one in particular it is quite a good book. Um, I do like this book, but it's it's very much. In, in the kind of, along the lines of that, that letterboxing type of fraternity, and then it breaks the moor up into grids, and um, up here. so the whole moor is broken down into grids, and for each square it has a particular place or item of interest um, for that grid reference. Um, so what it's encouraging you to do is to go to each grid and find um, the particular object. Sometimes they're not difficult to find. It might be a, a pool or a tour or something like that. Other times it's um, a particular plant that might be growing there at a certain time of year. Um, a particular rock that's got, that's got an inscription on it, that kind of thing. Or a, this is a stone circle, Skull Hill. Um, but it's very much in that kind of collecting mode that you're collecting the item and once you've collected it you can tick the box off. Um, so again it's treating Dartmoor as, um, it, it's kind of an amalgam of treating Dartmoor as that place you have to seek objectives out on a bit like an adventure. But it does, it does knit it in with the history of the moor and the ecology and the climate and so on by making you look at particular um, things of interest rather than trying to find a rubber stamp, which, as Henry points out, um, you could do that in a town, in, you know, in a city. Um, and before I conclude, sorry this has gone on so long, I really ought to mention... Sherlock Holmes, because that has um, inspired another um, element to people who visit the moor, that uh, Sherlock Holmes wrote one particular classic story of, um, sorry, Conan Doyle wrote one particular um, story of Sherlock Holmes um, 
we call the Hound of the Baskervilles, which you, probably most of you are familiar with. Um, it's sat on the moor. Uh, it's a fantastic kind of evocation of the uh, atmosphere and the um, history of the moor. It's, it's got elements of um, Bronze Age ruins, of ghostly happenings. There's this ghostly dog. Um, it's got the uh, land owning um, classes, the Baskerville family, as I was saying, that those kind of families really um, established themselves on the moor from the sort of 17th, 18th centuries onwards. Um, it's got the prison and the escaped prison, uh, all kinds of things. It's an absolutely fantastic story. But it has drawn people to the moor in its own right. People who just want to go on the, the kind of, the kind of Sherlock Holmes experience. Um, so a, a wonderful kind of um, aspect of the moor in its own right, but purely um, pure fantasy. But um, Conan Doyle um, was a doctor in Plymouth at one stage. Um, that's probably when he got his uh, first experiences of the moor and he visited the moor quite often. He stayed in Princetown at the hotel there and explored the area as the, as the basis of the Hound of the Baskervilles. So anyway, that is as much as I want to talk about the moor as you can probably bear to listen to for the time being. Um, just thought it would be uh, of interest to people who don't know Dartmoor at all and to give you an idea, because nowadays I tend to put my films up and I don't even have any commentary on them. So unless you know what you're looking at, all you can really do is just to appreciate the scenery. Um, but I wanted to give people a little bit of a kind of background to what they're actually looking at in the videos I put up on Dartmoor. So hope you enjoy future videos on Dartmoor and thanks very much for listening to all this. Bye for now.